you. Um, Karl Over is a man of few words, except on the page where he is, of course, a man of millions, which are now themselves read by millions. He's the archetypal existential loner hero, only he has four children. He's an intellectual, except most days he'd prefer to talk football. An acutely shy man, he's yet willing to tell readers of the New York Times absolutely everything that happens to him for a week, including the bowel movements. <laughs> but I'm speaking here of the Carl Over who's made out of sentences. To describe the human man feels to me impossible. Anything I could think to say about him or his many contradictions he's already said about himself. I want to speak instead about his literary provocation as I see it, which is basically to say whatever is, is enough. Maybe that doesn't sound very provocative, but in a culture in which people are forever being sold artificial stories about themselves, aspirational stories, political stories, pseudo-philosophical stories, delusional stories, Karl Over stands apart as a writer concerned with the thing in itself. Not the metaphor for the thing or the simile for the thing or the theory of the thing, but the thing in itself. Yes, for him, whatever it is, is enough. And I think this apparently simple statement has had a profound effect both on readers and writers. To readers, his work says, hey, see this life that you're living, with its everyday sadness and smallness, filled as it is with children's parties and beer drinking and disappointing parents and houses and streets and trees and sunshine and rain and buildings and mountaintops. Well, this is also enough. Your life, like mine, is both a great struggle, a heroic drama, and a minor tragedy, just like everybody's. It is both beautiful and utterly banal, both innocent and joyful, nothing but surface, and of a profound and ultimately, ultimately unknowable vertical depth. To read my struggle is to confront the idea that every one of us is a many-volume book of equal interest and intensity, of equal beauty, although you'd never know that from speaking to the real Karl Over or to any human being. But writing can be the revelation of that fact. And his writing has been, for me, a kind of revelation. He's helped me to see that everything and anything can be turned into writing. Nothing so shameful as to be beneath writing, and no idea so elevated or complicated it can't be brought back down into a simple prose, clear as a mountain fjord. I want to thank him for that. It's been a true gift to me, and I suspect to many writers. It's difficult to communicate sometimes to non-writers the shame that can attach itself to writing, the sense in the writer that there is something peculiar and unnatural, even violent, in this desire to encapsulate and to, to describe, to retell and reorganize the chaos of experience into a molded thing constructed from words. The most boring and tautological thing you can say about a writer, that he tells the truth through lying, is at the heart, troubled heart of writing, and despite the cliche, it's fundamentally correct. But normal, happy people don't do that, the writer thinks. They don't lie in order to re-describe or tell the truth. My brother doesn't, my mother doesn't. They are in the thick of experience. They are authentic people as I am not, and they feel no need to describe their lives as well as live them. But then on the flip side of this emotion, there is also writerly pride the sense that perhaps one is special exactly because of this tendency towards auto-reflection and its external expression. The young Karl Ovi of book five experiences, like all ambitious young writers, these contradictory impulses simultaneously. The adult Karl Ovi has taken the shame and pride of writing and tried to transcend them both. The ultimate dream of my struggle, it seems to me, is that the work stops being writing altogether emerges with the things described. This was also Proust's dream and Joyce's and Naipaul's and Dostoevsky's, though each approached the idea in his own mode. It's a dream as old as Plato, at least, who also asked us not to attend to shadows, but to things in themselves. Only our greatest, most shameful and prideful writers attempt this impossible, beautiful, surreal, ultimately doomed attempt to merge writing with the world in itself and to lose the writer in writing. I think Karl Ovi is one of these. To become writing itself is, of course, not a thing anyone can do. 
but he has come closer than most. Ladies and gentlemen, Carlo V. Nausgaard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I have this reoccurring dream and it looks exactly like this. It's rather more like, <laughs> it's rather more like a nightmare. Because <laughs> there is a stage, and there is an audience and I go out there and I'm standing here and I'm supposed to sing. <laughs> and I can't sing, but I have to sing. And then I wake up. <laughs> I'll read something from book five of my struggle. And all you really have to know is that the protagonist is very young, he's 19 years old, and he is uh, a part of a creating writing course, which is a very big thing for him or for me when I was 19, um, because I wanted to be a writer. And this passage starts at the end of that year when he went there. After we had run through various dramatists and various drama traditions at the Academy, the idea was that we should write something in the genre ourselves, as usual. I put off doing this until the evening before it was due. Then I plodded off to Werfte to sit there all night. We had a standing offer of a desk there if we needed an undisturbed place to write in the afternoon and evening. I had borrowed the keys and done it a couple of times. There was something about being alone in a common room that I liked, perhaps because there was nothing in it that reminded me of myself. I wasn't quite sure why. That was just how it was. Also this evening, when I let myself in and walked through the empty hallway, up the empty stairs, and into the empty rooms at the top. The others had already handed in their contributions. Photocopies of their work lay in piles on the table in the adjacent room. I found a typewriter, put on some coffee, stared at a reflection on the room in the black windows, as though it had been pulled out of the drifting waters of Wagen. It was nine o'clock. I had decided I would sit there until I had finished, even if it took all night. I had no idea what to write. The coffee was ready. I drank a cup, smoked a cigarette, stared at the image of myself in the window, turned and looked at the bookshelves. They wouldn't have a photography book of scantily clad or naked woman hair, would they? <laughs> but they did have a book about the history of art. I pulled it down and leafed through. Some of the 16th and 17th century paintings were of naked women. <laughs> Perhaps there was something I could use there. <laughs> it was too big for me to fit into my trousers, and I didn't want to carry it under my arm, because even though the chance of someone appearing at this time was minimal, it wasn't impossible, and how would I explain lugging an art book down to the restroom? I put it in my bag and went down the spiral staircase and into the toilet. A picture by Raphael stood out at once. Two women in front of a well, one naked, the other dressed. The naked one was strikingly beautiful. She was looking enigmatically to the side. Her small breasts were pert, a strip of cloth covered her nether region, but the ties were visible and I got a hard one. I flipped through, stared at a picture by Rubens, the rape of daughters of Leucippus, 1618. One of the two naked women was the red-haired, pale, freckly type with a small chin and a full body. Then there was Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, 1485, where one breast was bared, and Titian, Venus of Urbino, 1538, in which the woman in the foreground had one hand resting between her legs, 
while she gazed straight at the observer with a provocative, self-assured expression on her face. I studied her naked breasts for a long time, her broad hips and small feet, but there were more to see, of course, and I went on to Bartholomeus, Sprangers, Vulcan and Maya, 1585, in which the woman, with her hands on a strong bearded man, thrusts her hips forward with a lustful glint in her eye. Her breast was supple, her skin was all white, her face almost childish. She was good. <laughs> the next was Delacroix, the death of Sardanapalus, 1827. The woman in the foreground had her back to us, one breast was revealed, thrust right forward, because she had a sword to her throat, and the whole of her bottom was visible, perfectly formed. During this time, as I flipped backward and forward, trying to decide which picture to go for, I moved slowly, holding myself back. Maybe Delacroix? No, it had to be Ingres. Odalisk with Slave, 1842. She's lying full length with her arms behind her head and is all wonderful curves. Or, oh, of course, the Turkish Bath, 1862. Only women in this one, and they were all naked. They sat and stood in every conceivable pose and every possible type was represented. Cool, passionate, half concealed, fully exposed. All skin, flesh and female forms as far as the eye could see. But which one? Oh, which one? The one with the chubby face and the open lips. I loved faces in which the mouths were slightly open and the teeth always visible. Or the blonde just behind with the haughty gaze. The one with the small breast staring at her hand. Or the one, oh yes, sitting behind her, leaning back, arms outstretched, eyes closed in ecstasy. It had to be her. Afterward, I stood still for a moment to make sure there was no one in the corridor outside. Then I went back up, returned to the book to its place on the shelf, poured myself a cup of coffee, lit a cigarette, and sat staring at the blank page. Nothing. I had nothing to write. I went for a little walk inside, browsed through the books, went into the photocopy room, skimmed through the other's works. They were what you would expect. Each and every one of them had written in complete keeping with their own particular style. Most I just cast a quick glance at. But I took Petras into the classroom and read it carefully. It was kind of absurd, almost surreal, Comedy, where people did totally unmotivated and pretty crazy things. It was high tempo, devoid of meaning. My mind impression was chaos and randomness. Surely I could do that too? I began to write, and I wrote quickly. One scene after the other appeared on the paper as a kind of extension of what I have read. There might have been some slight similarities in the characterizations. <laughs> What I got up to was also unmotivated and unexpected, but it was not a carbon copy of Petra's. Ultimately, the characters did do different things, and I was very pleased when I had a first draft at around three. I touched it up, went through the whole drama one more time, and by eight in the morning, I had got so far that I was able to photocopy the text ten times and put the copies in a pile beside the others. When the first student arrived at a quarter to 10, I was asleep in my chair. The whole day was spent analyzing the texts. I was praised for mine, although Hovland had some criticism regarding its dramatic quality. In other words, the link between the characters and the scenes. I defended myself by saying, there wasn't supposed to be a link. That was the whole point. <laughs> and he nodded and said yes. But even incoherence requires coherence. The rule of thumb for all writing is that you can write about boredom, but it mustn't be boring. <laughs> Petra had watched me during the analysis, but she said nothing. Even when Hovland asked her directly for her opinion, she said she had no comments to make. It was only when the lesson was over and people were tidying up and putting on coats that it came. You copied my text? She said. I did not, I said. You were here last night, you read my text, and then you wrote yours. That's copying, pure and simple. 
No, I said, I didn't read yours at all. How can I copy it if I haven't read it? Do you think I'm stupid or what? You sat there, read it, and wrote a variation over a theme. You might as well admit it. Well, I would admit it if there was anything in your claim, I said. But there isn't. I didn't read your text, and I didn't copy it. If there's any similarity at all, it's pure chance. Ha, she said, and got up, put her papers and books in her black bag. It makes no difference to me. It's all right if you copy what I do, but lying about it, that's not all right. I'm not lying, I said. I didn't know a thing until you read for us. She rolled her eyes, put on a jacket, and walked toward the exit. I waited a few minutes for my head to cool down and for Petra to be so far away that I couldn't catch up with her. Then I made my way home. I recognized this situation. It was the same as the one I had been in at school, when I had voted for myself at the class rep and received only one vote. <laughs> and someone found out by asking everyone in the class who they had voted for. I denied it. They couldn't prove anything. I just said, no, it wasn't true. In this case, it wasn't possible to prove anything. No one else but me knew that I had read her piece. I just had to keep denying it. She was the one making a fool out of herself. But I had no great desire to show my face there again. For if no one else knew for certain, I did. The night before, it had seemed natural, a matter of course. I had only borrowed a little from her. Surely that was justified. But during the analysis and in our subsequent exchange, it took on a different aspect. I had plagiarized her work. And what did that make me? How could I become so desperate that I not only plagiarized a fellow student's work, but on top of that deluded myself into thinking I had made up everything myself? Once I had copied a poem into my diary and pretended it was me who had written it. I had been 12 at that time, and strange as it might be that I could so openly dupe myself. You wrote this, Kalova, you did, while I had copied from a book. Age was a mitigating circumstance. No, I was 20, though, an adult man. How could I have knowingly done anything so base? For the next few weeks, I stayed at home. I wrote my novel. It was hopeless, but I was nearing the end, and it was important I had something concrete and tangible to show for my work this year. I had sent a text, the one Øystein Lønn had read, to the Kaplan magazine Signale, and one day it came back. I nurtured wild hopes of an acceptance as I opened the envelope, but guessed which way the wind was blowing, so it was no surprise when I read. Dear Karl-Ove Knuskov, thank you for sending me your contribution. I read it with interest, but I'm afraid I cannot use it in Signale 1989. Best regards, Lars Sorbe Christensen. It gave me a little frisson of excitement to see Lars Aube Christensen's signature. It meant he had read what I had written. For a few minutes, at any rate, I had filled his mind with what existed in mine. Ecstasy brought out orange and lemons. I played it again and again, right until the Lillos released their Hjernen er alene, The Brain is Alone. Then, that was what was played on my stereo day and night. Outside, the skies were lighter and the rain fell less often. The feelings of spring, which had been so strong when I was a boy, which had filled all my senses and somehow raised body and soul after the winter's heaviness and darkness, overcame me again. I kept at my novel. I wouldn't finish it until the semester was over but I plan to hand in what I've done as my final assignment at the academy. It was the same novel that had got me into the course, and there was no development evident in it. I wrote in exactly the same style now as I had done then. The whole year has been wasted. The sole difference was that when they accepted me, I thought I was a writer, while now, on the verge of finishing, I knew I wasn't. 
One evening, Yngve, my brother, and Aspjørn appeared on the steps. Are you coming out? Aspjørn said. I'd love to, I said, but I don't have any money. You can borrow some if you want, Aspjørn said. Yngve has a broken heart, so we, can, uh, we have to drink him through it. It's over with Yngvil, Yngve said, and smiled. Okay, I said. Count me in. Hang on a moment. I grabbed my jacket and tobacco and walked to town with them. The next three days were a blur. We drank day and night, slept at Aspion's, got drunk in the morning, ate in town, continued drinking in his apartment, went out in the evening to all sorts of weird places, such as Uglen or the bar at Rika, and it was wonderful. Nothing could beat the feeling of walking across Torgamenningen and Fisketorg in the middle of the day, drunk. It was as though I was right and everyone else was wrong. As though I was free and everyone else tied and bound to everyday life. And with Yngve and Aspion, it didn't seem wrong or excessive, just fun. On the last night, we didn't know it would be the last. We took cans of spray paint with us. At Hulen, where we ended up, the place wasn't very full. When I went to the toilet, I spray painted the slogan inside the cubicle. Soon after, a member of the staff came with a cloth and bucket to clean it off. Once he had left, I did it again. We laughed and decided to go the whole hug, spray paint some buildings in town, and we went out to Mölnpris. I wrote, you two stops rock and roll along a big brick wall in letters as high as myself. They had just played at the rooftop. It hadn't been good, and Bono had formulated the slogan, U2 stops traffic, which was even less good. While Aspion wrote, Ricky Nelson rules okay over the tram depot wall. And Yngve wrote, Cat, we need you to rap on another wall. We continued like that towards his collective, where we stopped to have more to drink. An hour later, we had all crashed out. When we woke up, it was to the fear of what we had done because the trail led to us. The graffiti started outside Hulen and continued all the way here to the wall beside the door where you could read, Yngve is a damn... It wouldn't take much of an investigation to work out where the vandals who had sprayed painted the whole of Mölnpris lived. Especially Aspion was jittery, but I wasn't immune. And that was strange because all I wanted to do was keep on drinking, live the life, not give a damn. Yet I hit a wall whenever I did that, a wall of petite bourgeois and middle-class manners, which could not be broken down without enormous anguish and fear. I wanted to, but I couldn't. Deep down, I was decent and proper, a goody-goody, and I thought perhaps that was also why I couldn't write. I wasn't wild enough, not artistic enough. In short, much too normal for my writing to take off. What had made me believe anything else? Oh, but this was the life lie. What I had learned over the course of the year at the Writing Academy was that there was a literature that was real literature, the true lofty variety, which stretched from Homer's epics and the Greek dramas through the course of history up to the present day with writers such as Ole Robert Sunde, Thor Ulven, Eldre Lunden, Kjartan Flögstad, Georg Johannesen, Liv Lundberg, Anne Bø, Ellen Einan, Steina Löding, Jon Fosse, Terje Dragset, Hans Herbjørnsrud, Jan Kjærsta, Øystein Lønn, Sven Javol, Finn Øglen, The Dane, Søren Ulrik Thomsen and Mikael Strunge, The Swedes, Katarina Frostenson and Stig Larsson. I knew that the great Scandinavian poet of this century was Gunnar Ekelöf, and the great Finnish-Swedish modernist Gunnar Björling. I knew that our own Rolf Jakobsen wasn't fit to tie their shoelaces. And Ola Wohauge was rooted in tradition to a far greater degree than they were. I knew that the last great innovation in the novel took place in France in the 1960s, and that it was ongoing, especially in the novel of Claude Simon. I also knew that I couldn't reinvent the novel. I couldn't even copy those who were being innovative as I didn't understand where the novel's essence lay. I was blind, I couldn't read. If I read Stig Larsson's introduction, for example, I couldn't say what was new about it or what the essence was. 
I read all the novels the way I had once read crime fiction and thrillers. The endless series of books I had read as a 13 or 14 year old about Black September and Jekyll, about spies during the Second World War and Randy Elephant Hunters in Africa. What has changed during this year was that now I definitely knew that there were differences, but this hadn't had any impact on my own writing. To solve this problem, I had made a subgenre of the modern novel my own. This was the one I marked as my ideal. American novels and short stories written by Bret Easton Ellis, Jane Ann Phillips, Jay McGurney, Barry Gifford. This was how I excused what I wrote. I had gained an insight at great expense, but it was real and important. I was not a writer. What writers had, I did not have. I fought against this insight. I told myself I might be able to have what writers had. It might be attainable, provided I persisted for long enough, while knowing, knowing in fact, this was only a consolation. Probably Jon Fosse, my teacher, had been right. Probably my talent did consist in writing about literature and not writing literature itself. This was my final assessment, some days after going on a bender with Ingvar Ospion, walking home from the academy after handling in my manuscript. The novel wasn't finished, and I had decided to spend the rest of the spring and summer on it. When it was completed, I would send it to a publisher. I had decided on Keppel, to whom I felt some loyalty after the personal rejection by Lars Aube Christensen. I assumed I would get another rejection, but I wasn't entirely sure. They might see something in my writing that Jon Fossa and Ragnar Hovren hadn't. After all, they too had seen something in as much as they had accepted me into the course. This was a small hope, but it was there, and would be there right until a letter from Kaplan landed in my mailbox. It wasn't over until then. The light in the town had been changing character during the spring. The dampness and the gloom of the autumn and winter use were gone. Now the colors were dry and light, and with the white houses reflecting the light, even the indirect light, when the sun was behind the clouds, shimmering and bright, it was as though as the whole tone had risen. In the autumn and winter, Bergen was like a bowl. It lay still and took whatever came its way. In the spring and summer, it was as though the mountains folded back like the petals of a flower and the tone burst forth in its own right, humming and quivering. You couldn't sit inside in the evenings then. I knocked on Morten's door, asked if he wanted to go out with me to Christian, and if so, could he lend me some money? <laughs> he could, and we perched at the table, staring at all the beautiful girls who were out walking. Not the black-clad intellectual kind, but the nicely dressed, blonde, conventional kind. While we discussed how difficult everything was, and we slowly got drunk, and the evening dissolved into the usual darkness. I woke up under a bush by Little Lunga Lake, with someone tugging at me. It was a policeman. He said I couldn't sleep here. I got up sleepily and went home. I knocked on Ingvild's door in a new collective. She was surprised to see me, but also happy. I sensed, and I was happy too. It was a big collective with a corner window facing Nygårdsgatan and the Grig Hall. I said hello to, others, to the others living there, faces I had seen but not spoken to, all in some way or other connected with Ingve. Ingve was fully integrated into student life. That was good to see. At the same time, it made her harder to reach. I was on the outside. She said twice she wanted me as a friend, and I assumed that probably meant she didn't want me as a boyfriend. We sat there on the big sofa. She had made some tea, seemed happy. I looked at her, tried not to show how depressed I was, how sorry I was that we weren't together and never would be. Then I smiled and talked about more pleasurable matters. And when I left, she must have thought it was all over as far as I was concerned, and now we were actually only friends. Before leaving, I asked her if she could lend me a hundred kroner or two. <laughs> In fact, I was flat broke, didn't even have enough money for a smoke. Yes, of course, she said, but I want it back. 
goes without saying, I said, have you got 200? <laughs> I owed both Ingvar and Aspen so much that I couldn't borrow anymore. I also owed Morten quite a bit and Jonolov and Anna. I also begged a hundred here and a hundred there when I had been out of Ingvar's friends. No one was that careful when they were out drinking and I didn't have to pay everyone back. Ingvar had 200. I stuffed the money in my pocket and went downstairs as she returned to her room. Strange, I thought as I emerged. I felt the warm air on my face and saw the row of trees that had begun to burst into leaf behind the Grig Hall. The moment she was out of sight, I missed her. I had seen her only a few minutes earlier. She had been sitting a meter away from me, her knees together and her upper body leaning over the table. And now I was both excited and sad at the thought that she might be sitting alone in her room at this minute, at the mere knowledge that she existed. At the end of May, Ingve had exams, and I joined them in the evenings when they were out celebrating. The town was awash with people. They were everywhere. The air was warm. The trees were an explosion of green. And as I walked around in the evening beneath the light sky, and the dusk grey streets that never really became dark. All of this gave me strength. All of this lifted my mood. I had such a strong feeling of being alive, and not least, that I wanted to live more. The year was over. The next day we would be having the end of year meal at the academy and be given the certificate, or whatever it was, to prove we had attended the course. I would go, say goodbye to everyone, and then I would turn my back Never think about it again. Among English student friends, spirits were high. Bear after bear was brought to our table. And even though I didn't say much, even though I was temporarily my silent self, I was still there. I drank and smiled and looked at the others who babbled away about this and that. Ola was the only person I knew. The others I had only seen. So I sat down beside him. He had always taken me under his wing in the sense that he took me seriously and listened to what I said, as though there was something sensible or interesting in it, although he himself was light years above it. He even laughed at my jokes. But I didn't want to impose on him or Yngve, who sat there with his head raised, clinking glasses and talking. By the time the lights flashed and we drank up, then went downstairs to hang around outside until we all gathered as usual. I was so drunk that I felt as if I were in a tunnel. The slides were all dark. The light was only ahead. Wherever I was looking or thinking, I was free. There's our Shasta, I said. Enough already, he said. It's not funny, even if you think it is. It is pretty funny, I said. Shall we get going? What are we waiting for? Yngve came over to me. Easy now. He said, OK, I said, but let's move. We're we waiting for someone. Aren't you pleased it went well? Of course. He turned to the others. I rummaged through my pockets for cigarettes, couldn't make my lighter work, and threw it to the ground. Got a light? I asked the guy who resembled Kjarsta, and he nodded, took out the lighter and lit my cigarette, cupping his hand to shield the flame. I spat and took a drag, looking around me. The girls with us were four, five years older than me. But I was good looking. Surely this wasn't the first time a 20-year-old had fucked a 25-year-old? <laughs> but I had nothing to say to them, even when I was as drunk as I was now. So there was no hope there. You had to say something first. That much I had learned. <laughs> Suddenly they started walking. I followed them, always staying in the mid middle of the crowd. I saw Yngve's head bobbing, bobbing up and down a few meters ahead of me. And the luminous May night with all the smells, the animated voices, all the other people on the streets, my brain was wearing with thoughts of how good this was. I was a student in Bergen, surrounded by other students. We were off to a party, walking through the streets of Hayden toward Nygods Park which lay still, breathing quietly in the darkness between all the roads and buildings. It was 1989. I was 20 years old, 
full of life and energy. And watching the others walking with me, I thought, they weren't like that, only I was. I rose higher and higher, further and further, while they stayed where they were. Fucking media students, fucking media brats, fucking media theorists. What did they know about life? What did they know about what was really important? Listen to my heart beating. Listen to my heart beating, you dozy fucking little imbeciles. Listen to it beating. Look at me. Look at the strength I got. I could crush every last one of them. And it wouldn't be a problem either. I could just go on and on and on. They could belittle me. They could humiliate me. They always had. But I would never give up. It wasn't in my makeup, while all the other idiots who thought they were so damned clever, they had nothing inside of them. They were completely hollow. The park. Oh, Jesus, the entrance to the park. Oh, shit, how beautiful. The dense green foliage, nearly black in the gathering dusk, and the pond, the gravel and the benches. I took it all in. It became me. I carried it within me. They stopped. One of them pulled out a bunch of keys from the trousers pocket and opened a door to a detached house on the opposite side of the street from the park. We went up an old battered staircase, entered an old battered apartment. There was a high ceiling, a fireplace in the corner, rag rugs on the wooden floor, 50s furniture bought at the flea market or at Freetex, the Salvation Army shop, a poster of Madonna, a poster of Elvis with a gun that Warhol had done, and a poster of the first Godfather film. We sat down. Spirits and glasses appeared on the table. Yngve sat at the head of the table. I sat at the opposite end. I didn't like having anyone close to me, as we had on a sofa. I drank. More darkness. They discussed. I threw in comments. Yngve sent me occasional glances, and I could see he didn't like what I said or the way I said it. He thought I was showing him up. Let him think that it wasn't my problem. I got up and went to the toilet. I pissed in the sink and laughed at the idea of them putting in the plug, filling the sink with water and washing the faces the following morning. I went back, poured more whiskey, almost everything was dark now. Look at the park, I said. What about it, someone said. Easy now, psycho, Ingvi said. I dragged myself to my feet, grabbed my glass and hurled it at him as hard as I could. It hit him in the face. He fell forward. Everyone got up screaming, rushed to his side. I stood still for a moment and watched the scene unfolding. Then I went into the hall, put on my shoes and jacket and staggered down the stairs, onto the street, and into the park. The feeling of finally having acted was strong. I looked up at the sky, which was light and bright and wonderful, and stared into the green darkness of the park. And then I was gone. It was as though I had been switched off. I woke up on a corridor floor. It was light. The sun was streaming in through the windows. I sat up. There were several doors along the corridor. An old lady stood eyeing me. Behind her, a younger woman, perhaps 40, she was eyeing me too. They didn't say anything, but they looked scared. I struggled to my feet. I was still drunk, my body laden. I understood nothing. It was like being in a dream, but I knew that I was conscious and staggered off down the corridor, a hand against the wall every now and then. There was something about a fire engine, a fire and a fire engine, wasn't there? At the end of the corridor there was a staircase, at the bottom a door with frosted glass in the top part. I went down the stairs, pushed open the door, stopped it outside and squinted into the sun. In front of me was the end wall of the science building, to the left was Lille Lunga Lake. I turned and looked at the building where I had slept, it was white and made of brick. A big police car came down the road and turned into the gravel area in front of me as two women came out of the door behind me. Two officers walked toward me and stopped. 
I think there's a fire, I said. A fire engine went that way, I said, pointing across. It's not here, it's further away, it must be. That's him, said a woman behind me. <laughs> what are you doing here, one policeman said. I don't know, I said, I woke up here. But I think you should hurry. <laughs> What's your name? I looked at him. I teetered to the side. He put his hand on my shoulder to steady me. What difference does it make what my name is, I said. What's the name? You better come with us, he said. In the car? Yes, come now. He put his hand on my arm and led me to the car, pushed open the door, and I got in at the back, a large space which I had all to myself. Now I had experienced this as well, being driven through in the streets of Bergen in a police car. Had they arrested me? But it was the end of year meal today. There were no sirens wailing or anything. They drove sedately and stopped at all the traffic lights. They arrived at the police station, grabbed my arm again, and led me into the building. I need to make a telephone call, I said. It's important. I should be at a meeting. They had to know I won't be coming. I have the right to make a call. I know that. I was laughing inside. This was just like a film. Me, flanked by two policemen, asking to make a telephone call. And I got my way. They stopped by a phone at the end of the corridor. I didn't know the number to the writing academy. There was a telephone director underneath. I tried to look it up and failed. I turned to them. I give up, I said. OK, they said, and led me to a hatch where I had to empty my pockets and hand over my belt. And then they stared me down to the cellar or whatever it was. At any rate, there were iron doors on either side of the corridor, and I had to go through one of them. The cell was completely bare except for a big blue mattress. Sleep it off here. Someone will collect you for questioning when you wake up. Yes, sir, I said in English, standing in the middle of the cell until I had closed the door behind them. Then I lied down on the blue mattress and laughed to myself for a long time before falling asleep. The next time I woke up, I was still drunk, and everything that had happened out there and on the way here had something dreamlike about it. But the iron door and the concrete floor were tangible enough. I knocked on the door. I ought to have shouted, but I didn't know quite what. God? Yes. God, I woken up, I shouted. God, God. Shut up, someone shouted. That frightened me a bit, and I sat down on a mattress. Afterward, the door was unlocked, and a policeman stared in at me. Are you sober now, he said. Yes, I think so, I said. Perhaps not completely, though. Better than before, anyway. Come with me, he said. We went up from the cellar, him first, me next, into an elevator and through the floors. He knocked on a door, we went into an office. An older man, maybe 50, maybe 55, plain clothes, looked at me. Sit down, he said. I sat down on the chair in the front of his desk. You were found in Florida, he said. You'd fallen asleep in the corridor of a nursing home. What were you doing there? I don't know, I said. I was so drunk, I don't remember a thing, just that I woke up there. Do you live in Bergen? Yes. What's your name? Karl Ove Knausgård. Have you any convictions? Convictions? Have you ever been convicted of anything? Drugs, breaking and entering? No, no, no. He looked over at a man standing in a doorway. Will you check that? The man went into the office next door. While he was there, the man who was questioning me sat, head down, filling in a form without saying a word. Blinds covered the windows outside, between the slats, the sky was blue. The second man came back. Nothing, he said. You don't remember anything, said the man questioning me. Earlier in the evening, you don't remember anything? Where did you go? I was at a party by the park. Who were you with? My brother, amongst others, and some of his friends. He looked at me. We better call him in then. Who? Your brother. What's he got to do with this? <laughs> and what is all this about? I slept in the corridor of a nursing home. That's not good, I know. And you might consider it breaking and entering. But that's all I did. You don't remember anything, he said. The home was burgled last night. And in the immediate vicinity, there was a car crash. So things were happening. Then we found you in the corridor of the same home. That's what this is about. 
What's your brother's name? Ingvi Knausgård. His address and yours? I told him, you'll be hearing from us, you can go now. I was escorted down to the ground floor, given my few possessions, and I went into the parking lot outside. I was so tired I could barely walk. I stopped several times to catch my breath, and before Steinkjellergaten I had to sit down on a step. I simply had no energy left. Up the hill, would I make it? But ten minutes later, after the passers-by had stared at me, every single one, I got to my feet and lurched up the hill. The walk home from the police station took me close to an hour. In my room, I lay down on the bed and fell asleep for the third time within 24 hours. Not for long. When I opened my eyes again, it was still early afternoon. The heaviness had left my body. It felt normal now, apart for a terrible hunger. I ate ten slices of bread and cheese, drank a lighter of milk with Nesquik, and went to the phone booth to call the academy. Fortunately, Sagan was there. I told him I had been arrested and I hadn't been able to go to the dinner. Arrested? He said. Are you joking? No, I said. I spent the night in a cell. I'm still in a bad way, I'm afraid to say. Could you send me the certificate, do you think? Certainly, he said. Shame you weren't here for a meal. Arrested, you say? Yes, I said. Thank you for everything this year anyway. I'm sure we'll meet again. I hung up, and with my last coins, I caught the bus into town. The sky was dark blue, the sun red, and above Aske, the clouds in the east looked as if they were on fire. I walked past the student center and down to Mölnpris, intending to visit Yngve. Perhaps he could clarify what had happened. The door was open, and I went up the stairs to the floor where the collective was and rang at the bell. Lina, a nice blonde girl from Estlana, a few years older than me, opened the door. She looked at me with something akin to fear in her eyes. Is Yngve in? I said. She nodded. Come in, she said. He's in his room. I went in, took off my shoes, kept my jacket on, knocked softly on Yngve's door and opened it. He was standing by the stereo and turned when he heard me. I stared at him in amazement. Half his face was covered with a bandage. Suddenly it all came back to me. I had hurled a glass at him with all the strength I possessed. I had thrown it in his eye. He didn't say anything, just looked at me. Did I do that? I said. Yes, he said. Don't you remember? Yes, I do know, I said. Did I hit you in the eye? Are you blind? He sat down on the chair. No, the eye is intact. You hit me just next to it. I had to have stitches. There will be a permanent scar. I began to cry. I didn't mean it, I said. I didn't mean it. I don't know why I did it. I didn't mean it. Can you forgive me? Oingve, can you forgive me? He sat like an emperor on the chair in the room, his back erect, legs apart, one hand on his knee, looking at me. I couldn't meet his gaze. I couldn't look at him. I lowered my head and sobbed. Thank you.